The heavens are telling the glory of God. All creation is shouting for joy. Let us sing to the glory of our creator. Let us worship the one who is with us always. Let us pray. Creator God, who formed in love the heavens and the earth as reflections of your glory, we pray to you as the author of life and the source of all goodness, that we might joyfully follow the one who was and is and is to be, even Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
A reading of Psalm 4. Answer me when I call, O God of my right. You gave me room when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. How long, you people, shall my honor suffer shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? But know that the Lord has set apart the faithful for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. When you are disturbed, do not sin. Ponder it on your beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, Oh, that we might see some good. Let the light of your face shine on us, O Lord. You have put gladness in my heart more than when their grain and wine abound. I will both lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, O Lord, make me lie down in safety. In preparation for silent prayer, let us remember Judith Nellen, Peggy Lynn, Carol Langloy, Sean Smith, Mia Falvey, Cody Pound, George Gray, Obi O'Brien, Perry Green, Finn Daly, Kayla Daly, Brooke Daly, Daniela and Matteo Siriello, and their parents, and all medical staff devoting their lives to helping children, the people of the Middle East, all servicemen and servicewomen, all prisoners of war, all innocents caught up in violence, all God's creatures, both great and small. Eternal God, to whom we offer our praise for your goodness, your steadfastness, and your loving kindness. We return our thanks to you as we acknowledge your kingship in our lives, even as we endeavor to enthrone you in our hearts in all that we think, say, and do. We confess our love for you and aspire to a faith worthy of your Son, Jesus of Nazareth, professing through our deeds that we continue to honor Christ's teachings and exalt Christ's name in our thoughts as well as in our speech. Holy Lord, we come before you with unanswered questions, with pressing concerns, with fears and with doubts. Accept us, Lord, just as we are, forgiving us when we fall short, then lifting us to new heights, transforming us, molding us to become all that we were meant to be, creatures of love and devotion, freely showing through our example that you are strong to save and quick to bless. Make us confident in our acceptance of your will, your law, and your spirit of generosity and peace. Omnipotent Father, we continue to pray for the good of this world which you created for our benefit, reminding us of the care which you have shown to us so that we might exhibit the same care in our dealings with one another. Ennoble our efforts to heal, to restore, and to mend all who are broken in body, in mind, or in spirit. May your church become, through your blessing, part of the remedy which will create among all nations and peoples the strength to persevere and the courage to accomplish all that needs to be done in the face of dangers, adversity, injustice, and ungodliness. Equip us with the mind of Christ in the holiness of his spirit so that all might live fully in concert with divine aims and intentions. And when our work here on earth is done, in your good time, O Father, we pray that we might be gathered into your house 
that you have so lovingly prepared for us for eternity. For it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the Gospel according to John, chapter 20, verses 24 through 29. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord, my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Here end the morning scripture lessons. Today, I'd like us to think about a man whom history unflatteringly knows as Doubting Thomas. And what a moment of reflection on him and his behavior may reveal about us here today. I'm not going to argue, as a number of preachers have over the last few years, that Thomas didn't deserve to be known as a doubter. And if he was a doubter, that such a reputation isn't as bad as it sounds. For example, I could contend that Thomas wasn't so much a doubter as he was simply a skeptic. 
which to my mind doesn't sound nearly as negative. At least that would make Thomas sound like many of us in the early 21st century. And that point of view has even become a bit fashionable today. There's something to be said for that, I guess. It's just not going to be said this morning from this pulpit, maybe next year. So then, what did happen to Thomas? The biblical record is not all that clear. While parts of the story of Thomas are known through traditions and legends of the early church. For example, Christians in India call Thomas the founder of the church in South Asia. But this morning I want to stick only to the scriptural story. And fortunately, the Bible itself gives us some clues about what Thomas was like before the crucifixion and the story of his encounter with the risen Christ in the upper room. Since a lot more is known about Peter and James and John, as well as Andrew, Simon the Zealot, and Matthew, and who can forget Judas Iscariot, conjecture about the character of Thomas has to be based almost entirely on just a couple of episodes from John's Gospel. You might recollect not long before the death of Christ that Jesus was called upon by his friends, Mary and Martha, to save the life of their dying brother, Lazarus. However, Jesus did not arrive in time. Lazarus had already been dead for a number of days by the time Christ arrived on the scene. Seemingly, there was nothing to be done. Confronted with the news, Jesus was undaunted. That much you might remember. But then Thomas had something curiously odd to say about that particular turn of events. He did not suggest that the disciples should expect a miracle. Instead, Thomas said this, let us too go that we may die with him. The scriptures do not record the reactions, if any, of the other disciples when invited by Thomas to die with Lazarus. Now, what would move someone to suggest dying with a recently deceased man? Surely this was not the reaction of a man given over to doubtfulness. On the contrary, Neither did skepticism. The only sense we could make of what Thomas had to say was that it would take a man of courageous faith to utter such a thing. We might remember that Peter behaved similarly, vowing to die with Christ before he ever would deny Jesus three times. Thomas called upon himself and his fellow disciples to carry on doggedly proceeding to continue in the path of Christ, even though it appeared that death itself was likely the end result. But here's the sad part of it all. For those of us who know the rest of the story, even Thomas himself gave up. At the foot of the cross, Thomas fled like all the rest, except for the women, of course, who not only remained at the foot of the cross, but also resolved to do their religious duty, to tend the body of the crucified one. But Thomas, he wasn't too different from Peter after all. The eternal question, of course, is this, what about us? What would we have done? Would we have fled? It's hard to predict, of course. Maybe having the benefit of hindsight we might have been moved to do the right thing, remaining faithful to the end, even the face in the face of despairing hopelessness and death. Of course, we will never know. Having the inspiration that comes from almost 2,000 years of reflection on the faithful courage of the early church, we ourselves might have risen to the occasion and persevered in the path of the saints and the martyrs, despite the failure of not only Thomas, but of all the disciples.
except the women, of course. There is much in the history of the church, both ancient and modern, which suggests the failures of the first generation of Christ's followers resulted in greater faithfulness by the following generations. After all, without those of faithful courage, the church might never have come into being. But here we are, faithful to the last, almost 2,000 years later. Not all of us will be presented with the opportunities for such heroics, however. Still, even in the history of our own congregation, there are indications that our forebears were called upon to persevere in the right path, despite the seeming hopelessness of the cause. Have you ever wondered why the cornerstone of this church gives the date of our gathering as 1778? Well, the official history of the state of Connecticut and our own official church history gives the date of our founding, not as 1778, but 1795. This is because the earlier attempt to gather a congregation in Colebrook failed, and failed quite spectacularly. It took another 17 years for those of faithful courage to carry the day with the arrival of our first pastor, Jonathan Edwards the Younger. Where the first generation gave up, their successors proved to be made of sterner stuff. They stayed the course. They persevered. May we be worthy of their efforts that have allowed us, over 225 years later, to continue to witness to the cause of Christ in this place. Amen.
May the love of God the Father, the grace of God the Son, and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit be with us and in our homes and with our loved ones now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.